Metaphysics of War by Julius Avola The Forms of Warlike Heroism The moment the individual succeeds in living as a hero, even if it is the last moment of his earthly life, weighs infinitely more on the scale of values than a protracted existence consuming monotonously among the trivialities of cities. War makes one realize the relativity of human life, and therefore also the law of a more-than-life, and thus war has always an anti-materialist value, a spiritual value. The sacrality of war constitutes a tradition in the highest sense of the term. The pacifist deprecation of it, as well as the conception of war as a, quote, sad necessity, or purely political natural phenomenon, does not correspond to any tradition. It is but a modern fabrication, born yesterday, as a side effect of decomposing democratic and materialist civilization. To the traditionally based worldview, all apparent realities are symbolic. This is therefore true of war as well, as is seen from the subjective and interior point of view. War and the path of God are thus merged into a single entity. The significant testimonies found within the Nordic German traditions regarding this are well known. Therefore, a fundamentally virile instinct is justified by tradition on a superior basis. The warrior's vocation really approaches the metaphysical peak and reflects the impulse to what is universal. The Sacrality of War Roman to Nordic Early Romans were highly religious, but this religiosity of theirs was not confined to an abstract and isolated sphere, but pervaded their experience in its entirety, including in itself the world of action, and therefore also the world of the warrior experience. The cult of victory which was believed to have prehistoric origins, was the secret spirit of the greatness of Rome, and of Rome's faith in its prophetic destiny. It was not mere superstition or eccentric fatalism. It was similar to other disciplines which can easily be found in the cycle of the greater Indo-European civilizations, and was the knowledge of points of juncture with invisible influences, the use of which men could develop, multiply, and lead to act on a higher plane, in addition to the everyday one. Thus, when the harmony was perfect, bringing about the removal of every obstacle and every resistance within an event complex, which was material and spiritual at the same time. The Roman ascesis of power necessarily possessed a spiritual and sacred aspect, and was regarded not only as a means to military and temporal greatness, but also as a means of contact and connection with supernal forces. For example, the ceremony of the triumph in Rome had a character which was far more religious than militaristic in a secular sense and many elements show that the Roman attributed the victory of his leaders less to their simply human attributes than to a transcendent force manifesting itself in a real manner through them, their heroism, and sometimes their sacrifice. The Imperator was originally the military leader, acclaimed on the battlefield in the moment of victory. In this moment, he seemed transfigured by a force from above, which imposed precisely the feeling of the Newman. This view extends to the myth of heroes, which merges with mystical doctrines such as Orphism, significantly uniting the character of the victorious warrior and the initiate, victor over death, in the same symbolism. These are precise indications of a heroism and a system of values, which develop into various more or less self-consciously spiritual paths, paths sanctified not only by the glorious material conquest which they mediate, but also by the face that they represent a sort of ritual evocation involving conquest of the intangible. The exhortation to the warrior in the ancient Celtic tradition was, quote, fight for your land and accept death if need be, since death is a victory and liberation to the soul. As for the properly Nordic tradition, 
well known to all as the part which concerns Valhalla, the seat of celestial immortality, reserved for the free divine stock and the heroes fallen on the battlefield. According to this tradition, no sacrifice or form of worship was more appreciated by the Supreme God and rich in supramundane fruits than that which is performed by the warrior who fights and falls on the battlefield. But this is not all. The spirits of the fallen heroes would add their forces to the phalanx of those who assist these celestial heroes in fighting in the Ragnarok. That is to say, the fate of the darkening of the divine which, according to these teachings, and also to the Greeks, has threatened the world since time immemorial. Meaning of the Crusades In the knightly orders of the medieval age, chivalry was considered the supranational community of those who were, quote, ready to run to war, wherever it might break out, and to bring to it the fear of their arms in defense of honor and of justice, end quote. The man of the Crusades was able to rise, to fight and to die for a purpose which, in its essence, was supra-political and supra-human, and to serve on a front defined by no longer what was particularistic, but rather by what was universal. This remains a value, an unshakable point of reference. Vedic Conceptions In the Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna is implored thusly, quote, Either you will be killed on the battlefield and attain the heavenly planets, or you will conquer and enjoy the earthly kingdom. Therefore, get up with determination and fight. Quote, Do thou fight for the sake of fighting, without considering happiness or distress, loss or gain, victory or defeat, and by so doing, you shall never incur fault. Quote, the material body of the indestructible, immeasurable, and eternal living entity is sure to come to an end. Therefore, fight. Quote, With the exception of you, all the soldiers here on both sides will be slain. Therefore, get up. Prepare to fight and win glory. Conquer your enemies and enjoy a flourishing kingdom. They are already put to death by my arrangement. And you, O Arjuna, can be an instrument in the fight. Therefore, kill them and do not be disturbed. Simply fight, and you will vanquish your enemies in battle. End quote. We see here again the identification of war with the path of God. The warrior ceases to act as a person. When he attains this level, a great non-human force transfigures his action making it absolute and pure, precisely at its extreme. Army as a Vision of the World Seneca writes, quote, There is only one sight able to command the attention of even a god, and it is that of a strong man battling with bad luck, especially if he has himself challenged it. End quote. The vision of one's life as membership within an army gives shape to an ethic of its own and to a precise inner attitude which arouses deep forces. On this basis, to seek membership in an actual army, with its disciplines and readiness for absolute action on the plane of material struggle, is the right direction and the path which must be followed. It is necessary to first feel oneself to be a soldier in spirit. Any external form can easily become the symbol and instrument of properly spiritual meanings. Two Heroisms War acts as a catharsis, as a purification, in Latin, ignis essentiae. According to René Quinton, quote, War is the natural state of males. As for the female, the sacred order is to conceive and then to nurture. Quote, the hero does not act from a sense of duty, but from love. End quote. Heroic experience and, in general, the experience of risk, of combat, of painful tension, 
must constitute for the individual one of those inner culminations in which the extreme intensity of life is almost transformed into something more than life. Two ways of overcoming the human level are open, the shift to the subhuman, down, or the shift to the superhuman, up. In one case, the beast reawakens, in the other, the hero in the true sense, the sacred and traditional sense. In the former, the race of nature revives, and in the latter, the super race. The assumptions of such heroic experience seem to possess an almost magical effectiveness. They are inner triumphs, which can determine even material victory and are a sort of evocation of divine forces intimately tied to tradition and the race of the spirit of a given stock. That is why, in the ritual of the triumph in Rome, the victorious leader bore the insignia of the Capitoline divinity. The Aryan Conception of Combat Broadly speaking, we find that, especially among ancient Aryan humanity, wars were thought of as images of a perennial fight between metaphysical forces. On the one hand, there was the Olympian and Luminous Principle, Uranic and Solar Truth. On the other hand, there was Raw Force, the Titanic, Telluric element, Barbaric in the classical sense, the demonic feminine principle of chaos. In various forms, from ancient times through the Middle Ages, the Olympian forces fought against the dark creatures of chaos. Saint Bernard addressed the Templars, quote, It is a glory for you to never leave the battle unless covered with laurels, but it is an even greater glory to earn on the battlefield an immortal crown, end quote. What fighting and heroic experience meant for the warrior was a change of values. A higher life manifests itself through death, and destruction, for the one who overcomes it, is a liberation. It is precisely in its most frightening aspects that the heroic outburst appears as a sort of manifestation of the divine, in its capacity of metaphysical force of destruction of the finite. The warrior who faces the vicissitudes of heroism with, quote, your mind absorbed in the supreme spirit, end quote, actively assumes the absolute divine force, transfigures himself within it, and frees himself by breaking through the limitations of the merely human state of existence. Quote, life, like a bow, the mind, like an arrow, the target to pierce, the supreme spirit, to join mind to spirit as the shot arrow hits its target, end quote. The one who fights the war on such grounds can find in it also the occasion to realize simultaneously a higher experience, that is, fighting and being a hero not so much as soldier, but as warrior, as a man who fights and loves to fight, not so much in the interest of material conquests as in the name of his king and of his tradition. Beyond the mysticism of war, in the higher Aryan conception as well as the Roman one, is the mysticism of victory. The soldiers of Fabius did not romantically swear to win or die, but rather to return as victors, as they indeed did. These are the fundamental characteristic elements of the highest Aryan conception of combat. To the extent that he is able to act in the purity and absoluteness which we have indicated, the warrior breaks the chains of the human, evokes the divine as metaphysical force of destruction of the finite, and attracts this force effectively into himself, finding in it his illumination and liberation. Victory, then, appears as the outward and visible sign of a consecration and a mystical rebirth achieved at the same point. The Furies and Death, whom the warrior has faced materially on the battlefield, contested spiritually within him in the form of a threatening eruption of the primordial forces of his being. As he triumphs over these, 
victory is his. True civilization is conceived of here in virile, active, and heroic terms. And it is on this basis that the elements which define all human greatness and the real rights of the peoples are understood. Specifically warrior values in the military context are only representations of a reality which in itself can have a higher, not merely ethical but even metaphysical meaning. We must recall the Olympian ideals of our most ancient and purest traditions. We will then be able to conceive as equally ours an aristocratic heroism, free from passion, proper to beings whose life center is truly on a higher plane, from which they are able to hurl themselves, beyond any tragedy, beyond any tie and any anguish, as irresistible forces. Everything today that is tragic and destructive can have, at least for the best of us, creative value.